Can, can, I, can I welcome you all, uh, distinguished business leaders from all over Europe, uh, to this uh, great conference today. And can I begin by congratulating uh, Google. Ten years ago, a research organization, uh, now a $180 billion company, uh, an expert in social innovation, Google Labs, Google Maps, Google Earth, Google Tutors, uh, making uh, great strides in putting services uh, to the people of this country and many other countries. And I want to congratulate Google particularly today on the launch of a project with us, the UK government, a new map of the world, an interactive map of the world, uh, whereby with the Meteorological Office and with the British Antarctic Survey, we will chart with Google, Google Earth, uh, the changes that are taking place in our climate, both now and prospectively. And I think this will be a huge tool for making people aware of all the great climate change issues of our time. I think everybody recognizes we're in the biggest economic and social change since the Industrial Revolution. I think behind the credit crunch and what's happening to oil and food prices around the world, people sense we're in the biggest restructuring of the global economy uh, we have seen uh, in our history. I think people also sense that there's a shift of power taking place from west to east as Asia is in the ascendant, rising as an economy. And I think as we've just heard, people also accept we're seeing a shift of power from state to people that is propelled by the new technology uh, that Google and so many of you are making available to people. And I think people may sense that we're on the throes also of creating the first truly global society, people able to communicate with each other, organize with each other, and at the same time find that they have common cause uh, with each other. Churchill once said that those who try to build the present in the image of the past will miss out entirely on the future. And he also warned about people who were facing change, resolved to be irresolute, he said, adamant for drift, solid for fluidity, and all-powerful for impotence. And that is a warning to all of us. So this is, I think, not the time for standard political speeches, not the time for the sort of speeches that politicians make going around the country where they go to each different town and give exactly the same uh, speech uh, and uh, usually are bored giving that speech themselves. This is the time for doing something different. Uh, there's a story told about Einstein, uh, the great uh, physicist, who ventured into the realm of uh, politics, as you know, at certain points in his life. And he published a, a book about his, uh, his thoughts and went around all the different towns of Britain giving a speech. And he gave exactly the same speech uh, to an audience uh, that was uh, in the different towns and cities of the, of the country. And he got so bored with doing it that one night his chauffeur who'd been driving him around, who'd listened to all the speeches uh, uh, during the, the time he'd been traveling the country, his chauffeur offered, having remembered everything that he said, to give the standard speech instead. So Einstein sat in the audience uh, and the chauffeur went up and gave the speech. And it went very well because he remembered every word of it until something went wrong. The chairman for the night decided to invite questions for the audience. <laughs> and the first question was, uh, uh, how do you uh, relate uh, your uh, theory of relativity to the intricacies of quantum mechanics? And the chauffeur was stumped, didn't quite not know what to do. And he said, look, friends, this question is so easy that I'm going to ask my chauffeur to come up from the audience <laughs> and answer the question. <laughs> now, I want to say today that your industry is driving the next stage of globalization, that the lessons we learn from the success of this industry are the lessons we've all to learn if we're going to make globalization work for the future, and that we can also learn lessons about how we build not simply a successful global economy, but a global society. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, first of all, that you stand for an open and non-protectionist economy. The only way the internet and the new technology can work is if there is openness and is if we are not protectionist. And I like to think that in uh, Britain, we've created the opportunities for the mobile, market to, mobile phone market to develop, for the broadband market to develop. Uh, we've pioneered the release of audiovisual uh, spectrum. Uh, we're moving in on the uh, broadband and trying to make it uh, more available to people. And we've got a light touch regulatory system, and we can talk about that in the questions uh, that, that benefits an industry where we're seeing the convergence of the telephone, the, tele the television, and the computer. So you stand for an open, non-protectionist economy. You also stand for a flexible economy that is capable of responding with light-touch regulation, not heavy-touch regulation, to the challenges of the time. You stand for 
innovation and therefore the flexibility that we need to support innovation. And I like to think that we are making it possible for people not only to uh, use net new technology, but to develop new technology in our country with the support we're giving for science. And you stand for inclusion. And of course, there are only 5% of people in Africa who can access the, the internet. But the demand is growing, and your ability to provide that in all the different continents of the world is something that makes me confident about the future. And you stand for a technology that empowers. So it's people that is, are empowered by everything that is happening. And these are exactly the lessons that we've got to learn if we're going to have a successful global economy. We will not have a global economy that works for the people of this world unless it is open, it is flexible, it is about free trade, it is non-protectionist, it is inclusive, it is empowering, and it is about building a society. The problem we've got at the moment is that protectionist sentiment is growing in almost every part of the world. If you go to America today, the debate is about how they can restrict imports from China and other countries. If you go to parts of Europe today, the debate is about heavy-handed regulation of hedge funds uh, or of sovereign wealth funds or of other uh, instruments uh, of uh, finance in the economy. If you look around the world at the moment, you've got a fearful population, partly because of the credit crunch, partly because of the rising food prices, partly because of rising oil prices. And there's absolutely no doubt that protectionist sentiment is growing, particularly in America and Europe. So what you stand for an open, flexible, and what I stand for an open, flexible, free trade economy is under threat from public sentiment. And why is that the case? It's because, of course, a million manufacturing jobs are being lost every year from America, Europe, and Japan to Asia. A quarter of a million service jobs are moving to India and to other countries as call centers and others are developed uh, uh, there. 60% of our um, uh, computers and 50% of our textiles are produced in uh, uh, China. Asia is now outproducing Europe. And you can see the public reaction in the States and in Europe as people become more fearful about their jobs. And ironically, all the great successes of globalization, which is to cut the price of consumer goods, which is also, in addition to that, to keep interest rates low because inflation is low as a result of the counterinflationary effect of Asian prices, are forgotten by people as they worry about their jobs, are insecure, and want to see politicians intervene to protect, to shelter, to stop the clock, to freeze frame. And that is the debate that we're seeing in many parts of Europe and America at the moment. When I was at the International Monetary Fund uh, meetings uh, some months ago, there were demonstrators outside. And one of them had a placard saying, worldwide campaign against globalization. <laughs> and, and that is the irony that all the beneficiaries of globalization, particularly in Europe and America, see globalization as a threat. They feel themselves victims and not beneficiaries. And at the same time, they feel themselves losers and not winners. So here we have this contradiction. We know that the only way we can have a successful globalization is following the principles of your industry, open, flexible, inclusive, empowering. We know also that public sentiment, just as at other times of rapid change, is moving to be protectionist. So what do we do about it? It seems to me pretty obvious that we have now got to put the case for globalization. First of all, we've got to show people that the growth in the world economy, as Chinese and Indian people become consumers, is going to be very substantial in the years to come. I expect the world economy to double in size in the next uh, 20 or 25 years. Uh, and even although we're going through the credit crunch and growth is faltering in America and Europe at the moment, we must not lose sight of the basic optimism of a world where Producers become consumers in Asia, and the world economy is going to grow at a very rapid rate. The second thing that I think we can tell people that is about an optimistic view of the future is, of course, this, that there are huge opportunities for people in every continent of the world. It's estimated that there will be a billion more people in skilled or professional jobs within the next 20 years. So the opportunity for social mobility, not just in China or India, but the opportunities for people to make the best of their talents in countries like ours and in America and across the, the, the whole of Europe are enormous indeed. The third thing, of course, is that technology will empower even more. And just as I look at what we can do in the public sector in Britain uh, to empower people in healthcare with greater 
access to information for self-medication and everything else, in education, greater access to information for people to study at home and to draw on the lectures and the lessons that come through the internet from schools and colleges and universities, in crime for people to map the areas where crime is happening and to be far more aware on a day-to-day, -day, sometimes hour-to-hour -hour basis of what's happening in the neighborhoods. All these great advances that are possible will empower people with new opportunities for the future. And I think it's also true, something else that we should say to people, we can in the next 20 years create a truly global society. Think of the monks in Burma. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, we would have had sentries standing over fax machines to stop information getting into a country. And now even with a repressive regime like Burma, information cannot be repressed forever. Information cannot be suppressed and it comes out of the country. Think of the Philippines uh, where President Estrada was brought down by what people called after a million people texted to come together in a demonstration, the first coup de text in history. And think of Make Poverty History. Millions of people around the world linked by the internet, galvanizing their efforts together to bring about substantial social change. So what are the policy changes that I would propose we consider? First of all, we've got to stand for free trade. We cannot allow protectionism to become the dominant mood because that will affect not just your industry, but every industry, and it will hold back the development of the world. Secondly, we must stand for greater flexibility in markets. The two great protected industries of the moment are the two industries that are causing us the greatest problems today. The oil industry with a cartel run by OPEC, the food industry with high levels of subsidy that are preventing prices uh, for people that are at a realistic level and preventing people from producing in countries and continents like Africa uh, at a level that they should. And we need to have flexible markets there. Thirdly, we've got to be more inclusive. The issue is not between change and no change. The issue is helping people cope with change. And that is why in every one of the industrialized countries, the opportunities of education to get new skills as unskilled work becomes less relevant for people must be there and must be made available. So we will have to invest heavily in education as well as in innovation uh, and research. Fourthly, we will need global institutions that meet the challenges of global times. And we need an IMF that is an early warning system for the world economy, a World Bank for the environment and not just development, a United Nations that can deal with the stabilization that's necessary in countries that need to be reconstructed. And we will need, of course, uh, to encourage the development of a global society uh, in our times. I believe that the challenges ahead for this world make us all optimistic rather than pessimistic. I believe that an industry like this can fight the protectionist sentiment that undoubtedly exists when people are fearful for change. But I believe that we must become proselytizers of a message that instead of a worldwide campaign against globalization being the common mood of the times, that we fight a worldwide campaign for globalization. It was said in ancient uh, Rome that when Cicero uh, spoke, people said from the eloquence of his remarks, great speech. But it was said in ancient Greece that when Demosthenes spoke, and he too was eloquent about what should be done, the public then said, let's march. And I believe that we should all be marching as one for a vision of globalization absolutely central to the industry you represent, open, flexible, inclusive, empowering, and building a global society in our times. That is a challenge that I believe we can all meet together. Thank you.